Hey, everyone, and welcome to our DAT hey. IQ weekly market update. I'm Ken Adamo, Chief of Analytics at DAT, joined by Ned Damon, who's our Principal Data Scientist, and Dean Croak, who's our Principal Industry Analyst. Welcome, guys. Glad to be here. Hi, Ken. Good to see you. Well, lots going on this week, right? St. Patrick's Day, March Madness, just fun times all around. Yeah, there. I went on a walk through with my uh, son through the neighborhood, and this one guy had like a giant St. Patrick's Day banner in his front yard and like a big red LED countdown sign to St. Patrick's Day. I gotta say, like I, I was not aware that people went that hard on St. Patrick's Day. We went out for a hike in a college town by me on uh, this past Saturday, and they had fake Patty's Day. So it must have been Saturday <laughs> before. It was crazy. It was just, it was wild. Um, spring has sprung. Uh, so for those not familiar with the show, back to business here. We're here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern, talking about trends in the freight market, what we're seeing, um, and most importantly, answering your questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the question or the comment or chat section, depending on your platform. We have a team of very talented folks who um, gets those questions over to us to be read on the air and hopefully provides you with some kind of cogent answer. So what's uh, what's nagging you there? Um, we have a, a really cool addition to this week's show. We'll be playing a clip from our sit down with David Spencer at Arrive Logistics. Um, and the full interview slash sit down slash discussion will be coming out tomorrow. Really great chat. Uh, so with that, I'm going to jump into our key trends for the week. Um, so we're starting to see a cresting pattern um, in spot rates. Dean's going to touch on that in a minute here. Um, kind of the things seem to be catching up is how I would summarize it, but Dean will provide a lot more data. Uh, we are seeing imports surge specifically in SoCal. Um, again, that's going to have an obvious downstream impact on trucking and other modes. And then the wild winter weather. We have a second headquarters in Denver. Um, so some of our folks out there are I think, still shoveling several feet of snow in some areas in Colorado and um, the center states. Um, interstates closed, record snows, blizzards, tornadoes, and just holy cow, stuff happening everywhere. So with that, we'll turn it over to Dean and walk us through our market update. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Uh, yeah, lots to talk about this week. Uh, I don't think that this week's weather events will have anywhere near the uh, impact on capacity that we saw during the polar vortex, which was just three weeks ago. So it looks like markets have caught up a little bit. Uh, there was a more of a normal pattern that emerged last week uh, in the load post volumes. Uh, both reefer and dry van dropped about 23% week over week. So returning to volumes that were seen just before the polar vortex hit, there was a little bit of easing in capacity in terms of truck posts. So that uh, dropped the load to truck ratio from 7.81 to 5.43, a drop of 30% in the LTR. Over in the refrigerated sector, again, 23% drop in volumes. There were more trucks posting for loads last week. Um, the refrigerated load to truck ratio dropped about the same amount in terms of percentage, dropped from 15.62 down to 11.02 loads per truck. Uh, flatbed, a little bit different. Flatbed's volumes uh, have now been on the rise for the last four weeks in a row. Uh, they were up 3% last week, so small incremental gains every week. They're more than double where they were last week. Capacity is extremely tight in the flatbed. Of course, um, you know, it's a hard job, and uh, with uh, driver demand high in flatbed and reefer, where it's easier, it's harder to find drivers in the flatbed sector. So capacity is naturally tight. Um, Capacity, uh, there were 1% fewer truck, slows, uh, truck posts last week in terms of capacity. So the load to truck ratio and flatbed moved up to 77.58 as a result of that. Um, over the market condition index, lots happening. As Ken mentioned, volumes are up 58% uh, 50, year over year as of the end of February, according to the IHS peers import market database. It's still causing a lot of congestion around the port markets. Uh, taking a look at uh, the West Coast in Los Angeles, uh, loads to all markets were paying $3.23 a mile, so they're up again this week. They're up $0.41 cents a mile since the middle of February. Uh, in the adjacent Ontario market, loads are averaging slightly higher at $3.27 a mile. So rates are increasing, capacity is tightening out of the West Coast, even though spot market volumes are, are somewhat flat to down. Um, the, Ken mentioned the, the big snowstorm uh, that played havoc with freight into and out of Denver late last week, loads to Denver. Uh, loads from Denver to Chicago were up to, up 43 cents a mile to a buck 74, uh, including fuel, uh, and that's of course ahead of uh, this 
this week's St. Patrick's Day Parade. Um, in the Bay Area, in Stockton, uh, rates were up for the fourth week in a row to an average of 3.63 a mile, and they're up 27 cents a mile to 3.35 for loads to Seattle. So capacity is still pretty, pretty tight on the West Coast. Of course, it's produce season. Um, produce season has started. Uh, it starts to ramp up both on the import and domestic side. Uh, in California, it produces about 58% of all of our fruit and veggies. Uh, the biggest market there is Fresno. Rates have been climbing for the last four weeks. They're up uh, 11, 11 cents, 11% 11 month over month to 263 a mile. Some of the high volume lanes we took a look at this week out of Fresno to Denver, uh, they're up a dollar and four a mile to 403. So loads to Denver up a dollar and four a mile. Uh, to Dallas, loads were up 57 cents a mile to 263. Uh, on the big lane to New York City, uh, rates were up to 270, an increase of 37 cents a mile in the last couple of weeks. Even north to Seattle out of Fresno, rates were up 86 cents a mile to 382. Uh, the, we talked last week about the Rio Grande area that was devastated by the polar vortex. The winter crop was devastated. So rates were down out of the Rio Grande Valley uh, to 303 a mile. They dropped about three cents, even though import volumes are on the rise this time of the year. So there's definitely less volume coming out of the valley. Um, last week, about 60% of our produce came from overseas. Most of that comes from the southern border. Uh, number one crop is still avocados, followed by cucumbers. Um, and the number one boarding, border crossing for carriers and brokers to, to focus on is Nogales, Arizona. It, it took in about 30% of all imported truckloads, followed by McAllen at 28%. In the flatbed sector, uh, load post volumes in the top 10 markets increased by just 1%, but spot rates dropped on average about 10 cents a mile in the top 10. They produce about 25% of our load post volumes. Um, in the south, um, after a week of very tight capacity around Memphis and Decatur and Birmingham, capacity ease rates dropped about 5 cents a mile last week. Uh, Capacity was tighter in Houston uh, last week. Even on lower volumes, rates were up five cents a mile to an average of 216 for all outbound loads. And in northeast, Pittsburgh's been particularly tight in terms of capacity. Uh, volumes were up 5% week over week. Capacity is very, very tight. Rates, rates jumped 26 cents a mile to almost $3 a mile out of Pittsburgh to all destinations. Taking a quick look at our year-over-year -year spot rates, uh, again, we're at sort of record levels again, even five-year record levels. Uh, but after 35 days of increasing spot rates, dry van rates started to crest around 242. They dipped slightly at the end of the week by three cents a mile, still up 83 cents a mile on this week last year. Uh, refrigerated, similar story, rates dropped five cents a mile to 262. Uh, compared to the same week last year, rates were $1.86. So they're about 76 cents a mile higher uh, last year, of course, there's still some colder weather in the upper half of the country, so refrigerated demand is still high uh, due to protect from freeze on bills of lading, uh, where shippers look to keep uh, traditional dry freight from freezing, especially those liquids. So wrapping up with our flatbed spot rates year over year review, um, Flatbed rates inched higher last week in contrast. They're up just one cent a mile to an average of 2.33. And compared to this week last year, they were $1.90 T. So, so they're about 41 cents a mile higher last week. So that's it for our weekly market update. If you want to find out more about what we've just covered, go to dat.com forward slash market update and download the weekly market update. And that's it, Ned, over to you for the rate forecast. Hey. As I say, before we get there, um, I think now's a really great time to run our clip uh, with David Spencer at Arrive. Um, this is just a small clip from the longer interview, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and we wanted to share this clip specifically because it talks about rapid growth and sort of how to deal with that from an analytical perspective. Um, so we're going to go ahead and roll that clip. And um, I hope you check out the, the longer form interview tomorrow. Like I said, I'm really pleased with how it turned out. And I'm thankful for David for taking time out of his day to, to talk with us. So let's roll it have an interesting viewpoint, right? When you're in a rapid growth business, you don't have to think back decades to think when you were the size of a small broker, right? Um, no less than a few years ago, um, you were considerably smaller, right? That's kind of the double-edged thing of rapid growth. What's one bit of advice you would give the arrive of five years ago as they embarked upon this journey of both revenue growth, for sure, but also data and analytics maturity? You know, to speak on what has been really beneficial for us over this growth is thinking about scale, right? Um, if we're currently a, a, a company of 900 to 1,000 in a year, we're gonna be a company of 2,000. Well, we need to be thinking about solutions that scale um, as our headcount grows. And we've gone through 
process improvement and, and changes in our workflows, new technology. Our data sources have changed. Um, flexibility in, in our analytics platform is key. That was a, a very short clip. <laughs> but again, what do they call that in, uh, in the biz? Ned and Dean, is that a, that a, a teaser or sizzle? Teaser, or yes. We're going to call it a trailer. teaser. Yes. No, but it, it really was a great conversation. And um, when you think about businesses that are growing that rapidly, uh, Arrive has been a company that's embraced scale. They haven't sort of shrieked away from it or, or, or used, you know, been afraid of scale. They've, they've leveraged it as a tool and an asset um, in building their business. So it's, it's just a really cool story, and I would encourage you to check it out. But uh, back to our business. See, segue. Uh, Ned's going to walk us through the short-term forecasts. Absolutely. So um, while we're getting into the short-term forecasts, I do want to note that a new version of the Ratecast model rolled out uh, on Friday. And so uh, we're going to be starting to see those impacts more and more as we go forward. Obviously, Ratecast, this is the core Ratecast model. Don't expect any like major transitions. We try and keep our, our updates relatively small, but uh, I, I believe you'll be pleased. Uh, people will be pleased with the, the, the outcome of this. So um, to start off with, we're going to look at our uh, van short-term forecasts and well, midterm forecasts, you can see in blue the market rate observed by DAT. Off to the right, you can see our short-term model in red, our flagship rate cast model in green, and our two blended forecasts in gold and silver that are mixtures of the two models in different amounts and in different ways. You can see there's a uh, kind of a little bit of convergence uh, through the end of March, although rate cast unsurprisingly, is uh, ha being a little bit more circumspect, especially with that recent downturn, whereas the short term is expecting that the um, good times aren't quite over for carriers in terms of rates. Uh, near the end of the month and into uh, April, Ratecast is expecting there to be a slight downturn of about five-ish, five to seven cents a mile. Uh, and I hope uh, for folks who are on the, the more broker shipper side, that, that trend will continue as we go forward. Uh, moving on to reefer, you can again see the market rate observed by DAT in blue. You can see the short term model in red. You can see our flagship rate cast model in green and our two blended forecasts in gold and silver. Here it's a very similar story where there's a lot of model agreement through the end of the month with rates being flat, more or less. Uh, and then uh, once we get into April, uh, rates, Ratecast is expecting rates to go down uh, and moving forward with that. Finally, we have our flatbed, which once more, we have in blue, the market rate observed by DAT. In red, our short-term model. In green, our flagship Ratecast model. And in gold and silver, our two blended forecasts. Um, I mean, it's kind of second verse, same as the first, or I suppose third verse in this particular case, where there's model agreement, except this time it's more on the upside, um, up and to the right about five cents moving through to the end of March. And then um, Ratecast is expecting rates to start heading down as we move into April, whereas the short term is a little bit more bullish. But uh, don't just take my word for these models. Ken, you got some, some spicy details about that? I do. Before we get to the official Ask IQ question for the week, I wanted to, we've got some questions rolling in, but um, I just wanted to put the call out there again and remind everyone, uh, go ahead and drop your questions in the comment or chat, and we will get to them. Usually they come all at once at the end, and we struggle to, we have to do a lightning round. So the sooner you get them in, the better chance we have of answering them. Uh, so for the official one, Ned, do you want to read it? I can't. My eyes are failing me. Okay. So, um, it's we're moving into a new quarter. So how has Ratecast been performing? Right. So uh, this question came up on the last video, and um, we wanted to prepare some stuff for this week. And we've also had a few folks reach out directly and through our Ask IQ inbox. So we figured we'd put some stuff together. And so for the first chart, we're going to do our world famous corn cob chart. We'll go ahead and pull that up. So what does this chart? Like, what is this actually telling us? So let's just level set. So the x-axis, right at the bottom, that's the predicted value. So that's coming out of Ratecast. The y is actual. 
So again, this is a key differentiator with Raycast versus some other methodologies out there. Um, some of our competitors, they have the x-axis as predicted and the y-axis is a newer version of the predicted. So it's not really, there's no real ground truth to speak of. That y column goes into rate view and actually pulls out what the actual value was on the day that Raycast was predicting. And in this specific example, this was all of the Raycast predictions on March first um, that matched a rate view rate. So that's 242,448 individual data points were scored, actual versus predicted. Um, and for up to 14 days out, so full two weeks of forecast. Even though we only show eight in the UI right now, you can grab the rest um, through Snowflake or any one of our customized methods. So let's just cut to the chase here. We shoot for 95% accuracy because marketing doesn't like to talk about error, but everyone in the data science and analytics world will talk about error. So what's the metric we use? We use mean absolute percent error. Why do we use that value? Because it keeps us honest. It penalizes both sides of a miss. So if we miss low or high, we take the absolute value. Um, so it's more kind of reflective of how off the model is. Um, so this run, I mean, there's a lot of volatility. We're going to be straight up with everyone listening. We did not hit our 95% accuracy number. No. Um, the storms, the, the storms, the, the volatility in the market, and some of the questions we have coming in today about rates, I think, are all indicative of why. Um, but I'm still very impressed with how the model performed. Um, using the accuracy metric, we're um, over 93.5% accurate, 93.5-ish. I'm rounding up a little bit. But the, the MAPE, that I was talking about earlier was 6.69%. So we were off plus or minus 6.69% in this um, time period. So about 93.5% uh, accurate. Yeah, 93.5% accurate on a 14 day. Now, as you can imagine, the first week of that forecast, we could get up here and, and sort of sandbag, but that's not what we're in the business to do. Because I think that eight day forecast that you see in the UI, I wrote down the numbers, it was upwards of 95.5% accurate. That's it not is. really. That's, that's moving the goalposts. We, 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 we prefer to be honest with y'all and um, give you the numbers and be consistent. We have nothing to hide, right? You can, you can audit us. You can go into rate view, and if you have a rate cast subscription, pull a few lanes, write down what we predicted, and then go fact check it and call us out if we miss. Um, moving to the next chart, I like this one because it gives you the longer context. This is how I, as a data-minded person, um, sort of explain away... The, this doesn't have March because we've only have really one day where we can capture a full 15 day strip. So this is all of the forecasts for all of the month of February, January, December, going all the way back. So you can see we were on quite a run there. Um, from August to January, each month we hit our 95% accuracy target. Um, you can see here that February was just a bit rough on us. So for the month, we were a little over 93% accurate. And that's all of our forecasts. So if you think about that, that's, that's going to be well over, what would that be, Ned? 200,000 times 30, oh, 28 God, business days. Yeah, yes. 5, million, 5 million predicted yes. values rounding up. Um, so if you compare all 5 million of those against the actual rate cast rates, we were over 93% accurate, which was a diversion from, uh, or I should say a departure from January where we were 95.5% accurate. But again, if you have a specific set of lanes that you're interested in seeing, we're happy to run those for you. This is everything. This is a whole enchilada. Um, and like I said, it goes all the way back. Um, and just to kind of quantify how big of an impact those storms had, um, February 2021 was our second worst month on record compared to April of 20, which we all know what happened in April of 20. Um, <laughs> oh boy. So, and even then, we still in our entire, essentially entire recorded history of Raycast being an active production model, we were never worse 14 days out than 90% accurate, which I think is a, a commendable thing for our data science team and Ned in particular. Um, anything to add, Ned or Dean? Um, I mean, I, I'm going to to step up and I'm gonna say that, that we're always working to improve the model. Like I was saying at the top of the forecast, we've layered in some new, uh, uh, functionality, some new exogenous variables that we hope are going to help improve model performance going forward. And, you know, also just in terms of how to use the model, I feel like one of the best 
ways to use the model is as an uh, additive to your own intuition, to your own understanding of the freight market, rather than having it be a pure substitute for, for what you're doing. Because 95% accurate is pretty dang good, but um, you know your book of business better than uh, anybody else. Sage advice. Yeah. All right. Want to walk us through some questions here, Ned? Absolutely. We have, uh, I think, a couple of questions that are all getting to what uh, everybody is thinking about. And that is, uh, we'll start off with, um, I don't see, uh, Casey. As a manufacturer shipping 350 loads per week on vans and flatbeds, I'm struggling to keep loads covered at our contracted rates. Therefore, I'm having to spot quote most of our loads. Any idea when you see this returning to somewhat of a normal? I'm getting hammered with these astronomical rates. Drivers are just naming them. Any suggestions? What? Yeah. Why don't you tackle that one to start, Dean? Uh, it's I've, I've written about this in my weekly update today. I... You know, capacity is as tight as it's ever been, as even Jason Miller said with, with his capacity tightness index. Uh, it's even tighter than it was in 2010 when we th we thought it was the tightest in a decade. Um, this is, you know, we had brokers last week asking where all the trucks had gone. Um, and I even talked to an operator who's uh, just started his own operator business on the weekend in the ref refrigerated space. And and he said, I have any any pick of a load here that I want to run at uh, at around four dollars a mile out of New England. He was showing me on the DAT app all of these load options that he had. He said, I've never seen this in in his twenty years of of history. So spot market demand is high. Um, I think it's just supply and demand. There is there is excessive demand for urgent loads to move in the spot market, and the, and the capacity is tight. It, there's a genuine shortage of drivers out there, um, particularly in flatbed, as we covered earlier. So I think what we're seeing here is that record high spot rates are attracting drivers to the market, uh, but not at the same rate that demand is growing. Yeah, I'm hearing. I, I've received more emails from shippers in the past couple of weeks than I think I have in my entire tenure at DAT so far. And they're seemingly universally perplexed. Mm. Um, not only are they not getting loads covered at their contract rate, but when they have to do, when they do go tap into the spot market, it's, I mean, I was seeing that on, on core lanes, a dollar a mile higher on the contract rates, uh, the, you know, the spot rate was over a dollar per mile higher than the contract rates they had on file with these carriers or brokers. So it's, I mean, we're starting to see signs, right, Dean, of it ebbing back a little bit now. Um, right, yeah, a little bit of easing in capacity in terms of uh, spot rate dropping, but I, you know, I think that we'll cover this a bit later, I guess, in our in our discussion about RFPs. But I think it'll be a little bit different in produce, um, given the confluence of you know increased vaccinations, warmer temperatures, restaurants opening up, uh, and and demand for produce probably being greater uh, this year than it's ever been. Yeah, so that's, I mean, uh, let's move on to another question. Uh, Jack from Uber Freight asks, how many weeks following inclement weather events do you typically tend to see rates normalized to their normal seasonal and cyclical pattern? I was thinking of van and winter weather, but also applies to hurricanes. And he adds, I read Dean's piece on comparing to 2014, so I'm looking for other examples in the broader expectation for winter weather events in general. Uh, I, I could have a crack at that. Just noticing some of the hurricanes in the last year, it seems to be within a 14-day period or two seven-day weeks that rates seem to stabilise uh, uh, based on inbound and outbound volume sort of adjusting based on how capacity is tight and how much damage there's been to infrastructure. So uh, that's normally how it happens. I think the 14 polar vortex was different in many respects, given that it was a much longer duration event. But the, the thing that I noticed in 2014, refrigerated rates went up, and I think the number was about 14 cents a mile, but they continued climbing all the way through to produce season. So that's a, there's a distinct possibility that could happen again this year, given the height of uh, rates already. I think um, the one thing to add is, on a, on a macro, I, I think a localized point that's all, you know, very prudent to think about on a macro sense. A lot of these previous weather events happened at coincidentally, like the ones we talk about, happened at the a flipping point of a larger freight cycle. Right, twenty fourteen polar vortex was at the inflection point of a freight cycle, so some of those impacts lasted way into the summer and beyond. The extremely active hurricane season in twenty seventeen with Harvey and Irma, and then ELDs proved to be the inflection point of another major freight cycle. So another thing to think about is, in theory, at least, we're not, 
The, if you think of like the last freight cycle kicking off last April, the next freight cycle in theory should be a down a downtrend. So, and I, again, I, I, we're we're constantly looking at that and seeing how how some of these events could move that one way or the other. Because I mean, the market's obviously fragile. We have a very very recent hard and fast empirical evidence that the market was not able to metabolize a couple of weeks of cold weather like it normally would. So if we, you know, if hurricane season started tomorrow and we had a couple doozies, um, recent evidence would indicate that the market's going to struggle to to catch up with that. Would you agree? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that the kind of ongoing effects of the the pandemic and everything else just mean that any kind of imbalance, any kind of short term disruption for your like the market heals much more slowly than than it used to. And, um, or at least it has, uh, over the last year to, to even relatively small shocks. But, well, you, all uh, of your pressure release valves are no longer available, or at least a, a majority of them. I mean, when's right. the last time we saw a rail surcharge in March? Right. I can't think of a time. So it's wild. Want to move us on Ned? Certainly. Stephen from, uh, Stephen from Blue Grace asks, aside from the normal capacity constraints driving truck load rates up, would we expect an increase in CPI to sustain higher truck ro- load rates going forward? Jerome Powell mentioned in the past Federal Reserve's intention to let inflation run hot. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we talked about this on the show a few weeks ago. To, which, to what extent does CPI fail to capture kind of the modern sense of inflation? I mean, if you look through that basket, you really kind of open up the hood. I don't know how exposed your average middle class American is to that basket as they were 50 years ago. And that might be a hot take. I don't know. I mean, I'm no Jay Powell or Janet Yellen or Ben Bernanke, but thank God, by the way. Um, but uh it's, it's, it, I, I look at a couple key things and then again, I'll turn it over to people who know a lot more about this than me and Dean and Ned, but like driver, like it's going to be hard to claw back some of these pretty substantial driver wage increases that we saw on the, the employee based fleets. You're seeing pay increase for a large number of leased or contracted fleets. Um, and then you're seeing these higher RFP rates come in um, for the broader market to substantiate that. So it's going to be really interesting to watch trucking specific or transport specific inflation, you know, air quotes inflation over the next year and see how much of that sticks versus how much of that turns when the market inevitably troughs back out. But mm. I'll turn it over to my my crew here. Yeah, I mean, in one perspective you could add is that, you know, we saw similar wage increases for drivers in 2018 uh, when the market tightened. And then, of course, those wage increases stayed within the operating costs into 2019. So when rates dropped, uh, margins were compressed, and then we ended up with a record number of bankruptcies in Q2 of last year. So that's the inevitable fallout of when the market turns is that, uh, you know, the operating costs will stay elevated. Uh, but, you know, that said, the, the, the margin is still pretty high between where rates were this time last year and where diesel is. So carriers are still making pretty good margins this time of the year, uh, given the height of rates. But, you know, diesel is increasing. So that's something that we need to watch uh, in the next quarter. Hey, not to jump in, Ned, I know you want to get a word in here, but I, I'll forget the thought if I don't ask it. Dean, do you think that, at least on the public front, like what we could read in the media, do you think the, the increases were one as permanent and two as widespread in eighteen? Because I don't get that, and I don't get that indication in what I've been reading and paying attention to. Um, I, I saw increases mostly in the flatbed sector because that was mostly a flatbed-driven uh, rate rally right. during two thousand and eighteen. So that was certainly the case. I think the. Uh, the general, you know, the overarching thing that's driving uh, the driver shortage is that the decreasing demographics in both the younger generation and the baby boom generation. So they've been a staple of the supply of drivers over the years. Uh, you know, baby boomers are no longer the majority of truck drivers on the road today. They're, they're a, a declining population. So I think there's a, a decrease of uh, supply coming in the industry, and that's that's forcing carriers across the board, not just flatbed, but in all forms of uh, transport to, to raise their rates uh, or pay rates to try and attract drivers back into the industry. Um, I guess the one thing that I wanted to add is it's really interesting to look at at goods basket comparisons. Um, 
I, this, this is maybe a little more heat than light, but uh, one of the things that's really interesting is where you, when you look at like the, how the prices of various goods have tracked versus like the CPI average, things that are more inflexible or are like tournament goods. So like um, houses or college or things like that have tracked way, 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 or medical care have tracked way, way, way above CPI versus um, more kind of durable, like standard goods. I mean, something, I guess a little bit of color around what you were saying. Yeah, you want to hit us with one more? Ned, think, yeah. and we'll wrap up. Certainly. We've got a question from, I'm not sure how to pronounce this name, but R-O-I-C versus W-A-C-C asks, I'm planning to start a small trucking uh, company, approximately 10 trucks. I value data very much. What DAT services would you suggest? Does DAT Power Office provide all the same features from Trucker's Edge? First of all, great name. I'm assuming it's return on invested capital versus weighted average cost of capital. Awesome ah. name. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let someone else answer the question. I just wanted to jump in with the, with the, with the name. Um, so I would need to get out the exact matrix of, of what things are offered in Power Office versus what things are offered in Trucker's Edge. Uh, my understanding is that Power Office has better rate view stuff plugged in by default, whereas Trucker's Edge, you're not getting as um, tightly fine-grained information on the uh, rate. It's kind of, it's a little bit more uh, time smeared, if that's kind of a meaningful term um, for one. Uh, and then there's also, let me not sound like a modern jackass about our products and make sure that I get the complete sheet. Uh, the other things that I would suggest is that we do offer a lot of, of free or relatively low cost content. Um, yeah, the seven, our producer asks seven day rates versus 15 day rates. Yeah, that's that's the difference. Um, but uh, we do offer a variety of free and low cost content like this podcast, like Dean's weekly newsletter. Uh, you can subscribe to the DAT um, top 50 lanes report by emailing, um, what is it, askiq at dat.com. And we'll be able to give you uh, short term historicals and short term forward looking predictions. Um, for the low, low cost of absolutely nothing other than having us email your, your inbox every so often. Um, and another thing that I would suggest that you take advantage of if you're starting a, a new trucking company, uh, this is a little bit less useful for carriers than it is for brokers, but with basically every DAT subscription, you do get access to the DAT directory. And directory is a really good tool to be able to do networking with, to be able to try and look up your counterparties and understand who it is that you're working with and get a better sense of, of what you can expect out of working with them. And also to do just market research to try and find your counterparties. Um, it's not quite as useful as something like um, Lane Makers, but Lane Makers is kind of... Uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure which program, which products Lane Makers comes bundled with. Yeah, the long um, and short is we're not the best uh, people to kind of guide you in your product <laughs> decision. We have an entire team of folks <laughs> at your disposal and sales and customer support to help with that. But um, I think from a macro sense, if you have access to rate view and you can pull some multi-lane downloads um, and Lane Makers is also a really great tool, whatever bundle or package gets you those features as well as access to the load board if you need it, um, I think that'll have you set. So that's what I would call in and... Uh, DAT1, Dean points out. Yes. Um, but kind of call in and chat with the customer service rep, and they'll get you pointed in the right direction. So, yeah. All right. Am I missing anything before I wrap up? I feel like um, I'm missing something. I want, I want to say one more thing about the uh, reaching out to us. If you email that Ask IQ inbox, we can provide you a more detailed coverage comparison if you prefer to have things done over email rather than talking to a human being. I'm not sure how. Uh, modern you are on, on talking to people on the phone. I personally hate talking to people on the phone. I, I strongly agree. But, um, Dean's webinar. We need to we need to shout out Dean's webinar before we close. You want to tell us about that, Dean? Yeah, we've got a webinar at uh, 1 p.m. this Thursday uh, with the Truckload Carriers Association. Uh, it's in conjunction with Axel, our new TMS cloud-based uh, uh, software partnership that we've got going. So that's on at 1 p.m. Uh, join us. You can uh, We can write to uh, DAT, um, ask IQ, and we can send you the uh, link if you like, or go to the Truckload Carriers website for more information. 
Awesome. Really look forward to that. Well, hey, thanks, everyone. Just as a, a point of um, uh, clerical clarification here, I will be out the next two weeks. I have my first business trip in over a year next week, and I will be on vacation the week after that. So Ned and Dean will be holding down the fort. Maybe they'll bring in a special guest. Maybe they'll prop up a, a, some kind of effigy of me um, in the corner. Who knows? At that point, I don't care, especially next week. <laughs> Can we get a cardboard okay. cutout of Ken? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why not um, I encourage you to check out Dean's weekly market update that he plugged earlier in the show it's chock full of awesome information Chris Kaplis's Freight Find podcast and don't forget to check out that webinar I think it'll be chock full of really awesome content especially for those carriers out there so with that we're going to sign off for this week hope to see you next week even though I won't be here I'll see you guys in about three weeks take care have a good week bye bye